Hello, hello everybody. It's your old pal Tuna here and welcome back to another video. As promised, I am here to bring you my Markets 101 video. My intention with this video is to literally tell you everything that I know about art markets and everything that I have learned in the past 10 years of doing them. So as I mentioned, my name is Tuna. If it's your first time here, I am an illustrator and comic artist from Canada. And yes, I do art markets. I have been doing them for about a decade now. And in fact, about seven years ago, before I even started making videos regularly on this channel, I made a video about doing art markets and as a little callback to it I happen to still have the exact same uh, flannel shirt in my wardrobe so I threw it on you know just to just to wrap things up in a fun way I also make vlogs usually at the markets that I go to so if you are interested in seeing more of that behind the scenes follow through in detail please feel welcome to go check out the other videos on my channel and because this is gonna be a long one I want to just mention before we get started if you could like the video at any point that you decide that you do like it I'd really appreciate that and as well if you are enjoying what I am offering please subscribe and lastly all of my videos are brought to you by my patrons. I don't have any sponsorship on this channel yet. Consider supporting me there. The link is below. But without further ado, let's talk all about markets. Just to preface, the kinds of markets that I go to are things like anime conventions, illustrator fairs, craft markets. So in general, those are going to be the kinds of things that I am focusing on here. And I put the question out to people like, what do you want me to talk about in this particular video? And one of the questions that I was getting over and over again is how to actually find these markets in order to apply and attend them. The first option that is pretty obvious, I mean, there's kind of two options. I'll go into a little more detail online. I wouldn't discount Google. In fact, just typing in like your city name plus craft market or art market or art fair, you're going to come up with a lot of results. And if you're lucky, someone might have an aggregate resource. Like I know here in Vancouver, there's an Instagram account called like YVR markets. And every week they post the markets that are happening that week. And as well, if you have access to them, there are multiple artist alley slash vendor networks online. These might be in the form of Facebook groups or discord channels, but those aren't necessarily as accessible via an internet search so be sure to start networking with people around you to uh, get access to these sorts of things obviously we're talking about online so the other half of that is gonna be in person and basically keep your eyes peeled you're gonna see flyers if you start looking for them they're gonna be posted on telephone poles maybe a community board at a rec center you can find little flyers at cafes around town and you can even check the newspaper because oftentimes there is advertising being done by the events in these places now you might be saying but uh, tuna that's that's how you find markets that are happening right now. And I hate to break it to you, that's exactly how it works. A large part of getting into markets is starting to do research about which ones you want to attend. So once you've found and documented all of these different markets that are taking place around you, it's time to actually go to them and check them out yourself. And the whole point of doing this is because you wanna see like, is this market gonna be a good fit for the product that you are selling? When you attend, you wanna pay attention to the clientele. You wanna see like how many people are there attending the market itself. And there's also an opportunity there to actually connect with the vendors who are already vending at the event. Don't take up too much of their time, but if you do ask them a few questions about maybe how they found out about it, if they're enjoying doing it, and if they have any other markets that they've done lately, these are really good ways to get a little bit of information uh, to enable you to apply in the coming event. So now that you have your list of markets, what you want to do is if you're a spreadsheet person, kind of like me, you can set up a spreadsheet, write down the event, when the event took place, and then try to estimate exactly when those applications are going to open to get a table. Usually it's no more than six months in advance. And now you have your spreadsheet and you can circle back to that next year and be like, oh, I wanted to go to this event in June and it's January now. So maybe I should go to the social media account or the website for that event and see if or when vendor spots open. You can follow their social media accounts in advance Advance when you hear about it. And oftentimes there are email mailing lists so that you can actually get a blast when applications open. Now here's the thing, there are a lot of markets out there. And once you start paying attention, you're gonna notice like the volume is way more than one person can do, even within one small city, let alone traveling. So if you are a beginner and you're looking for the right event to try out with, I highly recommend starting with something that is just a one day event versus a weekend or a three or four day convention. And if I were you, I would stay local unless you are in a situation where there is nothing 
something in your immediate vicinity because by staying local you will save on expenses such as travel and accommodations. And oftentimes these smaller local shows have a lower entry fees, which is a big part of starting out as well, not spending too much money without knowing you're gonna make a return on that. I think when you're starting out, it's maybe better to focus on markets that have a bit more of a theme. So if you're an illustrator like me, try and go to stuff that is illustration based rather than a wider, more generic market, because those generic markets can be a little bit of a dime a dozen and your people might not be there as much as they would be there at a market that is for the type of thing that you sell. Before you start to apply, I want to mention one more thing is to watch out for predatory markets and look out for the warning signs for markets that may be a predatory. I don't think this is something people talk about a lot in like public about markets, but there are a a lot of markets out there and not all of them have the best interests in mind of the vendors. The best way to get a feel for this is to talk to other vendors who have maybe done some of these markets who can warn you to stay away from them, but if you don't have that network built up yet, keep your eyes peeled for overscheduled markets. If a brand seems to be running a market every weekend or maybe even once a month, it's possible that they aren't committing to the advertising necessary to bring people to the market. And I think the markets that are a little more niche and limited, like once a year or twice a year, tend to draw out a more dedicated crowd who is excited to be there and maybe has been like saving up specifically to go versus people who are just walking down the street and are like, oh, okay, there's a market in here. Let's just pop in, you know, something to do. My mom calls it the free museum. <laughs> or the free art gallery, and I think that all the time when I see these kinds of shows. And one of the biggest red flags is if you see a market that is letting in vendors that sell MLM products, that is almost guaranteed to be a bad sign. If you don't know what MLM is, I recommend that you Google it. It doesn't mean men loving men. <laughs> And they can be hard to spot because there's a lot of them, but if you do see some that you recognize, you can probably be safe to put that market on the maybe don't, maybe don't go to a list. Okay, you have selected which markets you are interested in doing. You have your list ready for the year. Now, how do you apply to these markets? As I mentioned, timelines for applying are usually four to six months before the event actually happens. So right now it's January and I am currently applying for markets in June and July and August. But this really depends on the size of the show. Some bigger shows just start booking kind of a year in advance and some smaller shows are more of a month or two in advance. But I also think it's a bit of a warning sign if the market is like, six or four weeks away and they're still accepting applicants. It's like, why, why don't you already have vendors kind of thing? Something else to keep in mind is there are three kinds of admission processes for markets. One is called jury, which means that every vendor is specifically selected by the organizers to be in the market. One is first come first serve, which means anyone is accepted into the market based in the order of application. And the third is lottery, which basically means that the applications will be open for a certain amount of time. And then after the application period closes, the vendors will be selected at random. And when it comes to first come first serve applications, if you are applying for a popular event, it is no joke. Please, please be prepared. If they say that the application opens at 9 a.m., be there at 9 a.m. ready to fill out that form because if you miss your chance, you miss your chance. What to expect in an application is often you will need product photos or photos that are examples of the work that you intend to sell at the market. You'll probably need some sort of short creator bio. So if you're smart, put one in a Google doc and like write it out and then just copy and paste it again and again. If you're me, you have it kind of memorized and you type it out each time for some reason. You'll probably be asked for at least one link to your website or social media platform of choice. So if you don't already have one of those two things, absolutely get on that before the application process begins. It's pretty much a necessity for these kinds of things. You don't need to use social media if you don't want to, but you can use it to be a gallery of product photos or kind of behind the scenes stuff. And as an aside, these days, this is more important than ever because we are dealing with the rise of generated images that may or may not be created by a artist. <laughs> and so having a record of your process is really important. And it can also prove to the event that you're not buying items to resell, you are creating them yourself. The last thing that's becoming more popular is submitting a booth photo with your application. And this can turn off a lot of first timers because they're like, well, I don't have a booth photo. If it's not an option to leave that part blank, which if it is, that's totally okay. Consider doing a quick sketch of your idea for your booth, just to give the event an idea of the kind of booth setup that you're envisioning 
envisioning, it's better than nothing and it's totally okay. Another really popular question is about cost. I had people asking if I even needed to pay to get into them and I'm kind of like, whoa, we gotta start from zero here because some people don't know how it works at all which is fine, I'm not making fun of you, I'm just, I was surprised. Cost for a table averages between $50 and $200 per day. That'll really depend on the size of the event and if it's for profit or if it's not for profit. And if that sounds like a lot to you, it is. Unfortunately, you do have to spend money to make money, which we'll get into a little bit more later in the video as well. But don't let it turn you off. You always have the option of sharing a table with somebody else. Sometimes when you submit your application, there is an option to stay if you are going to be splitting with two people. But some events don't care. Once you get the table, you are able to invite somebody to split it with you or whatever. It is a great choice for bringing down the overhead. And if you're new to doing markets, you might not have that much product. So it actually might be better for you to create a more luscious half table than a full-size table with a lot of gaps. <laughs> Obviously, there's the cost of merchandise, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. And other expenses that you might want to keep in mind is stuff like transportation, which could be Ubers or even just the bus, time off work if you do usually work weekends, accommodations if you're traveling, and the cost of your display materials if you are truly vending for the first time. Now, because of all these startup costs, it's not uncommon to not make back your expenses at your first event. And I really don't want that to deter you if that does happen to happen. When I did my first market, it was a one day market here in Vancouver, kind of for like anime illustrator type thing. And I spent $50 on the table, which was a half size table and $50 on display and print costs. And I did not make $100 that day. I did not make my money back. That was 10 years ago now. And now it's a big part of my full-time art business. Congratulations, you have been accepted into your first market, or maybe it's your second or your third. Just wanna like tailor it up a bit, look into tuna for a little advice. And the first thing you might be thinking about is how to display your goods. You might also be thinking about what products to bring. So we could swip swap those two categories, but we are gonna start with display for this one. Something that I do to this day is I actually do a sketch of my table concept before I do anything. And this is partially because a lot of the markets that you go to, the chances of your table looking exactly the same at each market is pretty low. There's like placement considerations and table size variance often occurs. So sketching out your ideas in advance can give you, give you an idea of how much you can fit on your table and what items you might need to buy in order to properly display everything. There are two kind of like main categories of display that I want you to keep in mind. The first one is like verticality and the second one is clarity. Verticality is so important in market displays. You, you don't wanna just lay all your stuff out flat on top of the surface that is the table. I really enjoy using easels to prop up my books. I have built this really fun yellow display board for all my sticker sheets, but you don't have to get that fancy. There are all kinds of retail supplies that you can find that we'll go into in just a moment. And when it comes to clarity, that kind of regards uh, having all of your items visible so that people can see everything without having to kind of dig for them. Sketching out your idea in advance can also help you to prep if you want to make anything in advance, such as like a display board for your pins or your keychains and any signage that you might want to have to help your customer understand what's at your table. I basically forget to make all of the signs that I need if I haven't made this table sketch. So that's another reason why I always do it. So where can you find all of these display items? I think that this is like a misconception that this is difficult to do. Honestly, a lot of what I have comes from dollar stores and thrift stores. Easels, plastic containers, risers, cute baskets. Anytime I go to the thrift store and I find anything that I kind of like or think I could integrate into my display, I'll just grab it. I mean, it's a couple of bucks added to the pile. You can also use secondhand marketplaces like Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist and search up something like retail display. Sometimes stores will sell that kind of thing direct to consumers, I guess, for very reduced prices. And you can find all kinds of fun stuff. I had this really cool like card spinning rack that I got from there and like it was a little bit damaged. So it was like 10 or $15. And I think you can find some more unique kinds of things by going to these three types of of shops but if you need basics you need it tomorrow um there's always our favorite online retailer Amazon where you can find a lot of great stuff one of the most popular display items that I basically recommend to anyone who is doing paper media product is the wire grid storage cube our lord and savior there are quite a few varieties of them now there are a lot of interesting ways that you can customize them they collapse down really small for travel and they're not that expensive so if you do intend to do markets 
I would recommend investing in one of those. And I think like Walmart and stuff has them too, or wherever it is that you want to do your shopping. Lastly, there are retail supply stores in every major city, I would say. Here we have one called Eddie's Display and Hang Up. And these kinds of items are a little bit more expensive, but they are also a little bit more premium. So if you do feel like you want to step into that, just Google retail display your city and you will find places you can pick that sort of thing up. One of the most important things about considering in your display that I do think goes unconsidered sometimes when you're a beginner and I totally understand there's a lot to think about but something to keep in mind as you grow is branding and identity. The most important thing you want to do is grab the attention of the people at the market. Really important is that your booth is visible from afar. Verticality plays a big part in that but I think that a sign with your brand name that is very visible is kind of a must-have and something people don't usually want to invest in right away but it doesn't need to be expensive or complicated if you want to hand paint your brand name onto a piece of poster board like that is totally legit I'd maybe throw your website on there and I personally have a QR code uh, that leads to my link tree on my banner and a cartoon of myself some kind of visual to represent the brand and what it is that you're selling. Something that I've been doing in the past few years is really focusing in on my brand colors as well. Now don't worry too much about this first off, but start experimenting with how you want your brand identity to be. Over time, I've been moving towards this very specific shade of yellow and pairing that with black and white stripes so that if anybody asks me like, oh, which table is yours? I can say, oh, it's the yellow one with the black and white stripes. Just a few more notes before we move away from this particular topic. One thing that I really like that not everybody has, in fact, most people don't, is a privacy curtain. I erect a big curtain behind me, which is where I put my sign and also I can hang my apparel on display from there. And part of that is to remove visual clutter behind me, which might be people walking through the aisles or perhaps another vendor that is back to back. I also think that it creates a little bit more of an intimate experience, a little bit more of like a shop front kind of vibe, but it is pretty large to carry this like curtain rack thing with me. So it's not a must have, but I really like it. So I wanted to put it in this particular section. Also with regards to setting up your table, one thing to consider is giving yourself some space directly in front of you, which will be used for packaging or for eating your lunch. <laughs> I think it can be tempting to utilize the entire space for product, but if, if you're smart, you can arrange it so that you have some storage space for your easy to access items and then some personal space for taking notes, packing orders, yada yada. And also on that note of product storage, there's kind of two options of having all of your product available for customers to touch and grab for themselves off of your table, or if you wanna just have display copies out front where you're collecting and giving the item from behind the table to the customer. I would say it's kind of fun to have a little bit of both at your table, something like keeping the inexpensive items on the table for people to take themselves and then protecting anything that might be something you don't want to walk away behind the table to give to them upon purchase. Also keep in mind that you're gonna have to keep all of your stuff um, organized underneath the table. There is limited space under the table. I work out of large suitcases generally. Usually I can fit one big one and one little one and then I have everything in nice little boxes so that I can really easily find the product when the person wants to make a purchase. Now one thing to also keep in mind is if you feel like your display isn't really working, maybe it's the middle of the day or like the next day, there's nothing wrong with shuffling things around. If you feel like people aren't seeing what you want them to see, if you feel like people aren't understanding a certain product, experiment with how it is displayed on your table and I think you'll be surprised to see what kind of an impact that can have. The last thing I wanted to leave on in this category is the question of theft. Now theft is a problem in every retail situation. Hopefully it's not something that you're going to see a lot of in this journey. I think one big way you can deter this is making sure that you can see everything on your table and see everybody in front of you. Avoid the temptation to box yourself in in a way that might obscure your vision to all of the items. You can keep very easily pocketable items like small stickers back with you and just have a display up. And then again, having anything that's a higher price point back with you as well so that if things do walk away, it's not stuff that's going to ruin your day. While I know theft is a problem, it's not really something that I've experienced in any tangible way. I don't keep 
vigilant inventory of my <laughs> product, but it's not like I'm noticing that things are just missing when they should be there. So I don't really want you to worry about it too much. Just something to keep in mind. All right, it's the fun part. Let's talk about suppliers and products. So what kinds of products do you want to sell at your table? Maybe you're a maker that makes a specific type of thing and you're just going to sell what you make. That's super cool. But if you're an illustrator like me, there are a lot of options for the types of products that you can make. I think one thing to aim for at your table is some product variety. You want to have prints, you want to have stickers. If you're starting with anything, absolutely have both of those options because there's people who are going to want one over the other. And when you're deciding what you do want to make, consider the volume and storage necessary for it. One example of this is apparel, which I've been starting to get into more and more. And boy, howdy, does that stuff take up a lot of space. You want to have a few of each size and you know, I basically need a whole suitcase dedicated to it under the table and it's not ideal, but we do what we have to. <laughs> With product variety in mind, you also wanna have a variety of price points at your table. I start at $5 going up to my highest price item is like $100. And that way there's something for everybody. You don't have to like turn them away with having too much high priced items. And you wanna give people who wanna buy something high priced the opportunity to do that. <laughs> and I think that this point kind of deserves its own complete video. But when you are designing a product, I want you to think about why someone is going to buy that product from you specifically. And I, I really want you to give yourself an actual answer to that question. If you're selling a sticker of, you know, Scooby-Doo, then say they would buy this because they like stickers and they like Scooby-Doo. <laughs> if I'm talking about my sticker collection album, maybe the answer is because they need somewhere to put their stickers or they know a kid in their life that collects stickers that needs somewhere to put them. I don't know, there's a lot to go into on this particular topic, but I really think that considering why someone would buy your product really helps you to reframe the relationship between just making art and making art to sell. Yes, I am a little bit of a sellout. I think finding the balance between those two things is how you make it as a commercial artist. The next question is, do you wanna hand make all your items or do you wanna mass produce your items? I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed when you're entering into this space because you see a lot of people with really high quality, expensive looking mass produced product and you wanna be able to keep up with that. But I really think that you can start very handmade. When I did my first market, I worked with a local print shop. I got really short run, like five or 10 copies of my prints and they would print my stickers on these big sticker sheets and I would go in with scissors, baby, and I would hand cut out all of those stickers. And maybe you have to charge a little bit less for your stickers than someone who is selling a mass produced vinyl sticker, but your overhead is so much lower that you're not investing too much money ahead of time and running the risk of taking a while to turn any profit. You can move to mass production over time. I also talk about in my Patreon sticker club how I started out with hand cutting all of my stickers and once I had reached 50 subscribers a month, that enabled me to turn over to mass production. So it's all about growing as a business. You don't need to like hop in up here. You can if you want to, but you don't need to. You can start right here and just start rising to the top, baby. One thing I wanted to touch on, especially because my space is kind of like the convention space and the illustrator space is, should you make fan art products or should you make original products? I think this is also something that could be an entire video. The first point that I wanna make is that well, coming from my perspective, I make 100% original IP products. I don't sell fan art of any kind. And part of the reason is that fan art is actually illegal to sell in most cases. Now, obviously when you go to Comic-Con, it's like everyone's selling fan art. So nobody really cares in the IRL space, but if you do make fan art and you do intend to branch your business out into an online store, you will run into issues on platforms like Etsy with copyright. So while fan art is a really great way to draw attention to your brand and to connect with customers who might not know you for your work, it's definitely something I want you to be aware of <laughs> and keep in mind as you make stuff in the future. In lieu of fan art, I do want to recommend making fan art of like non IP stuff. And the way that I describe that is like you want to tap into a niche. So for example, I draw like a ton of cats and that's because I'm trying to appeal to cat fans. Maybe you like dogs. There's people who make food art exclusively. Maybe you want to make LGBT themed stuff your brand. So popular, so many people do that. And I think if you do want to make fan art, if that's part of what you do or all of what you do, 
just don't feel like you have to. That's all that I want to say is that don't try and shove yourself into a box that ends up trapping you. I do know people personally who decided to get into fan art, realize that yeah, it's a really good way to make money and unfortunately feel like they don't have the freedom now to transition to do what it is that they would prefer to do. Now, speaking of adapting over time, <laughs> I think it's really cool. As you do markets, you'll be able to respond to the demand of the consumers. You'll probably notice each market, there's an item that's really popular for some reason. And at every market, it's gonna be a different item. And you can use that information to inform the types of products that you make, the themes of the products that you make, the colors of the products that you make. I think that the back and forth process of consumer and artist is a really fun one to explore and just stay attentive to that information. Because for me, it's all about that balance of making what I wanna make that is what people wanna buy. Another big question that I get is how many items to stock for an event. Now, it's not really possible to give you like a specific number for that, but I think there's two ideas that you wanna come into it with, which is, do you wanna sell out or do you wanna have leftovers? If you don't wanna have leftovers, get as, as few or as little as you can, honestly. If you do intend to do multiple markets in the future or maybe open an online shop, it's my opinion that more is better. I don't know, if you've got the storage in your house, like it's okay to order more because once you've made that expense, once you've done the purchase, and even if you don't make all the money back on that purchase at your first market, for the next market, you already have stuff and you don't need to make that purchase again. So it's up to you how many you wanna bring. If you want me to give you like a specific number, okay, at my last market of the year in 2023, Square Reader Sales, which does not include my cash sales, I sold 80 sticker sheets, 32 prints, eight tote bags, and nine enamel pins. Now when it comes to something like an enamel pin, you have to order those with a minimum order quantity anyway. But when it comes to prints, those 32 prints, is that what I said? I think like 20 of them were one design, which is my most popular design. Whereas the other ones, it's like maybe one, maybe two, maybe five if I'm lucky. So oftentimes you are gonna find that there's one item that sells really well. Maybe it's a design or a specific type of item. And again, as you get to know the customers and the needs of the customers, you'll start to know where you want to have the most stock. I can think of a specific example of my friend at an anime con. She had done a fan art poster and in the first day of the con, she sold out of all of the copies that she brought. So she got on, she called up the print shop and she was like, I need more. And they printed more for the next day. So sometimes that's gonna happen. If you do have a multiple day show, you can do restock in the evening. And you know what, if you sell out, people are just gonna have to find you again when you do a reprint, aren't they? Grab a little business card, follow you on Instagram, all that good stuff. One more thing for this category is I wanna talk about packaging. Now, I feel like, especially when you're doing in-person sales, you wanna find the sweet spot between <laughs> being wasteful and appearing professional. And that level of professionality is dependent on the event that you're going to. So like an anime con might have a lower expectation of professionality versus a craft market, which might have a higher expectation. The bottom line though, is that you wanna have enough to protect the item. So if you're selling prints, please buy plastic sleeves to offer to the customers. And if you're selling ceramics, bring tissue paper, even bring a bag where possible. If you do wanna jazz stuff up with a little bit of branded packaging, you wanna consider using stuff that's reusable for the consumer. So like maybe a bag, like a little bag that they can use to store something in the future. Or if you wanna do like a backing card for a pin or a sticker, find some way to make it appealing so that maybe they could use it as a bookmark or a print on the wall, like a free little print. Another good way of cutting down on waste is using stamps instead of labels, but a stamp does have a higher buy-in cost than the labels, so you don't have to go out and buy a stamp first thing. And something you can do in preparation for the show is do some pre-packaging. This is gonna save you a bit of a headache at the actual event, like if you sell enamel pins, pin them onto the backing cards before you go, have some pre pre-prepared. Maybe if you're doing prints, you can stick business cards and sleeve them and seal them so that it's like bam, 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 onto the next sale. But speaking of business cards, they're way less necessary now than they ever have been before. QR codes are becoming much more of a standard. A lot of people at markets are expecting them and know how to interact with them now. So don't feel like you have to design or purchase business cards, but do have a nice little maybe framed thing up on your table that's like, find me online with a QR code to your your website or your link tree or your social media. If you do go that route though, I highly recommend you have some form of branding on 
pretty much all of the products that you sell. This is something I'm a little bit guilty of not doing, but if someone takes an item home and there is no business card there, it's very possible that they're not going to remember who they purchased it from, which is not good. So find some way that works for you, again, whether that's a stamp or a label, or maybe save your business cards specifically for purchases rather than just spraying them everywhere, you know, making it rain with business cards in the room. And the last note on product is that I want to advise against, I think this is more of a personal opinion, freebies at your table, such as free stickers, even if they are designed as a branding item. Because a lot of the times people can feel like they've gotten something from your table and it might deter them from making a purchase. So if you do want to include any freebies, be sure to offer it after someone makes a purchase or maybe as they're like walking away. <laughs> But again, I think that's just more of a personal opinion. All right, let's talk about another favorite. Let's talk about pricing. Do you want to know how to price your items? I think you do. The best way to get a handle on how to price your items is obviously to do uh, research on the market averages for those items. You can do this at events that you are vending at or aren't vending at. Like You can set your prices on the fly if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. Just grab a Sharpie and write it on and smack that label on there. Something else to keep in mind is the audience of the market. For example, teenagers or kids are going to have a lot less to spend than grown adults. So if you're selling at a show that is going to have a lot more teenagers versus adults, then you might want to have a slightly lower price point and vice versa. But I think more specifically, you're going to want to have different types of products for those different types of events, but that's up to you. Something to keep in mind as well is your this is, a, this is a line I have written down, so I'll be reading it out verbatim. Your price point per unit needs to be high enough to justify your overhead, but reasonable enough to sell volume. <laughs> some items will be priced higher, some items will be priced lower. All of your items are probably gonna have a different profit margin, but at the end of the day, you just want it to even out. <laughs> and this is gonna be a lot of trial and error, and depending on your interest in your bookkeeping, you might be really detailed about this, you might not, but However your bookkeeping looks, you want to keep track of all of your expenses that go into doing the market, making the items, buying the items, etc. I did mention before about displaying your prices. I definitely think that having your prices um, individually assigned to each item, so a label that says sticker sheets $10 or this mug is $75 is a little bit more easy for customers to understand than having one menu that lists all of the prices together. But I have tried both and they both work fine. <laughs> I think a lot of people are uncomfortable asking about the price of something though. So whichever you choose to do, make sure that it's really visible and easy for the customer to understand. With regards to money, um, the first thing I want to mention is a square reader or some type of payment processing terminal. The big question is, are they necessary? Um, like, no, but in my opinion, if you have any intention of doing more than one market, it's really worth investing. Um, I don't know if they still do the free dongle that plugs into the headphone jack of your phone but that's free and then they just take a payment processing on that i personally have the full little terminal thing which i bought like because it was on sale during like a black friday thing but for years i used the little tap square machine and here's the thing i would say 50 percent or more of my sales these days are card sales so if you don't have a payment processing terminal that could mean that you are losing 50 percent of your potential sales <laughs> Another benefit to using these types of applications and processors is you can get the data of your sales from your Square app, which can give you things like inventory information without having to track it manually. I think it's win-win. If I was you, I would invest in the price point that you want to invest in because dealing with things like Venmo or e-transfer or PayPal on the spot is a bit shady and not ideal. <laughs> when it comes to change, I feel like change and a float is like less important than ever now, but I try and keep about $50 to make change from with fives and tens. If you keep all of your prices rounded to the five or the $10 mark, you don't have to worry about in America, individual $1 bills or here in Canada, a bunch of heavy jingly coins. So that is why I generally try to round my prices out <laughs> in that way. Last note about pricing before we move on, there may be people who try to haggle with you on your prices and it is my opinion that that is a terrible precedent to set. Do not allow people to haggle with you on prices. Instead, be proactive and offer 
some sort of volume equal discount opportunity. So if you sell stickers for $5 each, you can say buy three, get one free, something along those lines, you know? I also find that that does help to drive up sales because who doesn't like getting a little discount, you know? And I have it for my sticker sheets. It's buy three, get the fourth one free. And I'll have people pick up two and be like, I want these. And I'm like, oh, if you get one more, you get another one for free. And let's be real, most people take me up on that offer. This next category is actually my favorite, attitude and salesmanship. I don't wanna say that this is like an underappreciated category because I do think people appreciate and understand the importance of this, but it's maybe something that doesn't come up as often as it should in these discussions. I call what I do while I'm at a market being in NPC mode. <laughs> I try to be friendly and approachable as well as attentive and alert. And for me, this uh, looks like me standing during the show. I very much prefer to stand and engage that way. Obviously not everybody can stand for eight to 10 hours a day. So finding whatever works for you that keeps you engaged with the people walking at your table is important. Some people think that you should bring something to work on, like to draw at your table or to take commissions while you're there. But for me, this takes my attention away from making sales. So unless you have like a buddy, someone who you're working with at your table who can engage with the customer while you're preoccupied, I do recommend not doing that. <laughs> If people want to do commissions, like take their name down, take their payment, take their email, and maybe their references and complete it after the show. I think that when you're selling things at a market, you are not only selling your product, but you are also selling yourself. So how you present yourself is very important. If you've never worked in a customer facing job, this might be really scary for you, but I promise it gets a lot easier with time and practice. One of the main things that I try to do for everyone that comes by my table is if I make eye contact with them, I will say hello, I will wave, or I will smile. If they choose not to make eye contact, I'm not going to open up a conversation. You want to be reading the body language of the people around you as best as you can to figure out kind of how they want to be engaged with. Personally, because I'm a vendor and I'm always on that other side of the table, I get really turned off when people are a little too aggressive with trying to greet me or pitch me. So reflect on yourself and think about how you like to be interacted with when you are on the other side of the table and try to find that persona in yourself. Something that's really worthwhile is to practice like a spiel for your items. You might wanna tell people like, if they're engaging with a certain product on your table, like how you made it. Maybe like your inspirations for why you made it or the design that's on it. I sell comics and graphic novels. So I like to have like a little pitch. So when someone picks it up, I'm like, oh, let me tell you a little bit about that. I'm the illustrator of this comic. It's written by a friend of mine. It's a horror tragedy, blah, blah, blah. Like keep it real short and sweet. <laughs> and it's okay if you stumble over your words, I do it literally all the time. <laughs> but you wanna be engaging with people who are at your table if you notice them interested in what you have at all. Something that I really like to do is to ask questions to people um, because I have a lot of cat stuff at my table and people are kind of maybe talking about cats or like looking at cats or maybe I have one that's a painting of Nori who's, oh, he's not up there. Surprise, surprise. I have a painting of Nori that I sell as a print and when people say, oh, that looks like, you know, that looks like chuckles whatever. I'm like, oh, can I see a picture of Chuckles? And so it kind of opens them up, engages you. And even if like, even if like these things don't lead to a sale, I think having positive interactions are really valuable for your brand for a lot of reasons. It might just like, you know, be nice to like be nice to people and make them have a good day and they get to show you a picture of their cat. Or maybe they'll remember you more because they had a little interaction of some kind. If you do sell fan art, asking questions about their relationship to the IP is also a really great way to start a conversation. And I also try to do, if people are, you know, browsing together and maybe they're having a conversation about what's on my table or like maybe even about something else, I do take it upon myself to interrupt and interject myself into that conversation. I mean, I think I could do it pretty well. Maybe you'll have to ask people if they feel like I'm overbearing or nosy, but I think it's a great way to kind of endear yourself and to make them feel a lot more comfortable with interacting with your work. As well, you're probably gonna get a lot of compliments from people and it's really frustrating when people look at it and they're like, oh my God, I'm obsessed. Everything you do is so wonderful. And they like, don't buy anything. It's gonna happen, it's gonna happen again and again. Don't let it get to you. I think there's a lot of reasons people have that they do or don't spend money, but always be gracious when you receive a compliment. And on the flip side, if anybody is ever rude, like roll off the back, roll off the back. If people are really rude, you can go ahead and 
tell them to stuff it. <laughs> but for the most part, just kind of laughing awkwardly or whatever, just let them move on. One type of interaction that you also might come to find is the chatty Cathy or the booth barnacle, as I prefer to call them. And these are people who overstay their welcome at your table, I would say, especially in a circumstance where they're blocking other people from being able to look at your products. This will probably happen, and I just want to tell you, feel comfortable in dismissing them politely. Don't feel like you have to give your energy <laughs> and attention to these people, because often they're not having a conversation with you, they're talking at you about something that they're interested in. There are just so many, so many memories. <laughs> I've gotten very good at like moving people along. You're gonna have to like experiment with strategies that work for you. But a lot of the time what I will do is continue to greet people who are looking at my stuff and to kind of direct my attention to those other people and often the person who's trying to take up my time and energy will kind of get the hint and move along if I just sort of stop engaging with them. I know it's harsh, but unfortunately, when you're dealing with the general public, you deal with all kinds of wonderful and less wonderful people. This next category we're gonna go over a little bit quickly, taxes and permits. Now, prefacing all of this, I am not a tax specialist, I am not a tax professional, I have an accountant who I pay to do these things for me. But the main thing that you wanna do is to understand your obligations before you go into it. Here in Canada, again, I, I think, you're not obligated to collect sales tax if you're making under a certain amount of money every year. Obviously, it's gonna be different for wherever you are in the world. If you have the opportunity to talk to fellow vendors, they can give you kind of like their perspective or what they do for these kinds of things. Here in Canada, you don't need any sort of sales permit to sell at a market. Usually it's arranged by the market themselves. But I know in places like Washington in the US where I have vended before, you need like, city sales permits and state sales permits and business licenses and you have to collect and remit tax <laughs> and it is really stressful and it is really scary and that's actually why i don't travel anymore outside of canada to sell stuff because that whole process just stinks not to mention customs importing exporting the whole thing is too much work for me so i am not the person to ask about these kinds of things as you get to know people in vendor circles, they will be able to tell you about their experiences and suggest ways to do this. A lot of the time, the market itself will advise you about what you need to do to satisfy their obligations. One of these things is also insurance. I do find markets around here require you to purchase vendor insurance. Sometimes it is included with the event and the event fees, but if you are required to get vendor insurance, don't be put off. It's very inexpensive and super easy to get. It's like, Again, Google vendor insurance, your country or your state, and you'll be able to fill out the form, get that insurance, and then, I don't know, it's like liability insurance. I don't know if, what that means exactly. I assume if something fell off of my display and hurt somebody that, that, that they would deal with that, but again, I don't read the fine print. I just do what I am told to do. <laughs> We have one more category. I have gone over almost everything that I want to say. I have been filming for so, so long now, but this is where I wanted to interject and just give you a bunch of tips that I feel like didn't really fit into any of those other categories. One thing is I think you should practice your table layout in advance if you've never done it before or if you are trying something very new for the first time. If you don't have a table that is suitable, just mark off a section of the floor with some tape and go to town. You also want to pack a market bag <laughs> that you are going to use for like literally every market you go to and I want you to include everything you think of that you could possibly need at the market. I'm talking tape, scissors, stick tack, pieces of paper, a measuring tape, clamps, personal effects like gum, painkillers. God knows I need painkillers at almost every market these days. And a portable battery for your phone, especially if you are using it to take square or digital payments. Like that uses up a lot of phone battery. So be sure to have an external battery and a cord so you can keep that thing juiced all day long. You also wanna bring stuff to keep you alive, such as snacks and a refillable water bottle. <laughs> if you vend alone like I do, you might not have the opportunity to leave your table for any length of time beyond zip into the bathroom. So make sure that you have everything that you need before you go and also please get a good night's sleep the day before, please. <laughs> I know it's tempting to like crunch till the last minute but you want to be well rested for what is going to be a very overwhelming day if you are an introvert who is used to hanging out in this room with your cat all day long. Something as well is I recommend that you dress in layers. A lot of the time convention halls, market 
places like can not they have their own ecosystem going on so it's like super hot and then it's super cold when they finally turn the ac on stuff like that so be like me wear a t-shirt wear a jacket on top <laughs> maybe bring a hat you never know i also think that when it comes to protecting your money uh fanny packs are better than something like a lockbox i don't think that a lockbox really makes a lot of sense if you are maybe having to leave your table to go to the bathroom and you're alone like do you want to carry a lockbox with you no you just want to have like your money in a little pouch or a fanny pack something that you can slip into your pocket even because obviously you never want to leave your cash unattended like people can steal a few stickers off your table it's not going to ruin the day but if someone took your cash bag which happens very frequently at larger anime conventions and those types of events that would be pretty devastating. So do consider how you want to protect your money leading up to the event. When it comes to bringing everything to the convention, I want you to pack very smart and as light as possible. Don't bring anything that you don't need. <laughs> like I mentioned, you're going to have only the space underneath your table to store all of your merchandise. And if you are transiting to the event, or maybe you are taking an Uber if you don't drive yourself, like you want to make sure that you can handle everything that you're bringing. Something to keep in mind is like if you need to take an Uber, but you need to unpack the uber and then like move everything from where you unpacked the uber to the market space itself like are you going to abandon that stuff sitting there if you can't bring it all in one go just stuff to think about in advance <laughs> now again if you are vending alone which is how i usually vend a really important thing is to make friends with the neighbors around you the other vendors are not your competition like they're kind of your competition but you're actually all colleagues when you think about it not only can they watch your table when you're doing things like going to the bathroom but you can also talk about your experience at the show and see like oh how are your sales oh my sales are like this and they can also tell you about their experience at other shows which is goes back to the first thing we talked about like how do you find out about markets well a lot of the time i'll get recommendations from other vendors at events that i'm doing i think it's really important as well to remember not to compare yourself to your neighbors especially with regards to like sales or how busy they appear to be i know that as someone who sells mostly original art and not fan art sometimes when i go to anime or fan expo style shows i get kind of self-conscious when people are just like the genshin impact is just flying off the shelves and here i am like trying to sell my comics but it's not about it's not a competition like how much money they make has nothing to do with you so try not to focus on that it's okay if it's in there, but try not to focus on that. If you are doing a multi-day show that allows you to keep your display up overnight, consider bringing some sort of tablecloth to put over top of your table while you're gone. Oftentimes there will be security or you'll know that it's locked up overnight, but at the same time, it just gives you a little bit more peace of mind. But as well, be sure to bring home any valuables. Don't leave anything that you wouldn't be, you know, not devastated to see missing <laughs> if you came back the next day. And if it's a multi-day show, consider scheduling a dinner with some of your fellow vendors at the end of the first day. It's really fun and invigorating to talk to people about their experience, maybe share some funny things that happened, get hyped for the next day, learn some ideas about what they've been doing that you could be doing. Everyone's gonna wanna go home quickly. So you'll go out, you smash some well-needed food in your faces, and then you go home and get a good night's sleep for tomorrow. Also, you might have the opportunity to do some product trading with fellow vendors. This is very common at all kinds of market events. Feel welcome to bring up the idea with other vendors. Don't be offended if they say no, but also if you don't want to trade and people ask you if you want to trade, don't feel obligated to say yes. It's totally okay. Okay, the very last thing that I want to tell you <laughs> today is don't worry as a first timer about making any goals for the weekend. I don't want you to stress about making money or selling a certain number of things. I want you to focus on being present. I want you to be excited. I want you to just have fun and take in the experience. You want to use this time to learn. Learn about what it's like to be at a market. Learn about the attendees. Learn about how your art interacts with people. Because this is the starting point for you in entering into what could be a decade-long career. I remember at some of the first markets that I ever did, the people that I met and the way that they welcomed me into the community with such open arms was what kept me coming back to markets year after year. So instead of focusing on things like money, I'm not telling you not to think about money, we all love money. Focus on the community, the environment, and the experience. Okay, you guys. <laughs> 
You did it. You made it to the end of this insane rambling. I really hope that something that I've said here today has been something that you didn't consider before, something that you can learn from for the future, and that maybe some of what I've said is actionable for you in terms of taking your first steps to get into the market scene because it has always treated me well. Over the years, it has changed so much, but I am so happy to be able to get out there in front of people with my work. Now, please, I am begging you. Obviously, I did my best to include everything that I know <laughs> in this video, but I have missed so much, I am sure. So please leave me a comment with anything that you feel like I missed, any tips that you have, anything that you've learned. I wanna hear about it in the comments. And as well, if there's anything else that you wanna learn more about, please leave your questions for a follow-up video that I might be able to make. Because I, I get a lot of questions from people who want to get into markets and start entering into this world. And I just want this video to be like, like, go watch this. This is everything that I have for you. All of my knowledge distilled into what I am sure is going to be like a very, very long video. All right, I'm gonna ask you again to like this video if you haven't, to subscribe to the channel if you wanna see more of my beautiful face. And I want to thank all of these cool people. These are my patrons over on Patreon in my snack pack. These are the people who allow me to take the time to make these videos, to inform you about things, to record my day-to-day -day life and show you behind the scenes of what it's like to be a full-time artist. Some of these people, they just give me a tip and they get all kinds of things like podcasts and digital downloads. Some of them are subscribed to higher tiers for mailable rewards like sticker sheets, prints, and one-of-a-kind weird items that I make on the fly because I feel like it. And I don't know how I would do what I do without them. So thank you to all of these people. Please consider joining them and getting your name in this really fun list. <laughs> but of course, I understand we can't support every creator we love online. So I just want to thank you for being here, for making it to the end of this video. And I hope you'll consider joining me next week for another one. Stay sparkly, don't let the cruel world dull your shine, and I will see you next time. I used 90% of my camera's battery to film this video. I think that's an accomplishment.